This was a film, as you have seen in the last moment, uh, which is 10 years old already. When I've shown it to Czech public eight years ago, it seemed, well, people were, well, I didn't believe it. It was overblown. It's not possible. So people trying to get Europe or to Britain in large amounts because of they cannot live in their own countries. Well, we have seen that already in 2015, 2015, and we, will, we are seeing it even now, further on. So, climate change is the most serious problem of public health in our world, and it will remain so in the next centuries, for sure, it will be worse than now. I have one more, uh, one more um, sentence to uh, to say to you, well, I, I have a sentence in Czech. Actually, it is an old leaflet from Ökologi Institute from Vienna, uh, uh, and it was issued originally in German in 1991. And there is a uh, there is a quotation from Prince Charles. So Prince Charles, well, the end of the 80s or 1990, I'm not sure, uh, said something like that. The efforts to lower the amount of greenhouse gases uh, with international agreements is welcome. However, they are coming 10 years too late. So Prince Charles is a very wise statesman. It was, he was very wise in the 80s already. And he knew at the end of the 80s that we've missed the opportunity to really reduce the amount of greenhouse gases. And it has its consequences, of course. So, climate change is becoming stronger and stronger, very conspicuous, apparent in our times. Not so, it was not so apparent uh, in the last millennium. It is caused by global warming, and global warming is caused by the fact that greenhouse effect became stronger than before. Why it became stronger? Mainly because, because due to due to CO2 from fossil fuels. Oxidation of fossil fuels inevitably means we are adding CO2 to the atmosphere, carbon dioxide. The Earth is warming because the greenhouse effect became stronger. However, what is greenhouse effect? Uh, there was uh, some research from years ago uh, that people are they well considered climate change as something serious depending on if they knew what is greenhouse effect or if they don't know it. And unfortunately most people don't know what it is. Even uh, scientists, many scientists, if I would ask some meteorologists in Czechia or anywhere, in Czechia especially, they would probably don't, would not know what to say about greenhouse effect. Oh, I have heard about it many times. What it is in, uh, actually? Uh, this is the answer. Greenhouse effect is a physical process in which the planet's surface is irradiated not just by the sun, but also by radiation emitted by the planetary atmosphere itself. So, emission from the planetary atmosphere downwards to the, to the ground, this is, or the, to the ocean, this is greenhouse effect. The essence of the effect is that the atmosphere has very different properties for solar radiation, which is mostly below 3 nanometer micrometers, so well, half a micrometer, this is some blue-green light, Red light is three quarters of a micrometer, so let's say. And there is another radiation, long wave infrared radiation, which is over three micrometers mostly. It is everywhere around us. And there is a plenty of that radiation. For example, that in a wall emits something like 400 and, uh, 430 watts per square meter. My face is warmer. It emits something like 500, 500 watts per square meter. Those windows are a bit colder, they emit less. But there's a plenty of that radiation around us. This is a terrestrial radiation, radiation emitted by everything around us because of its temperature, of temperature of the, of the earth. And uh, the atmosphere would not be able to absorb or emit that radiation if it would be composed just from oxygen and nitrogen. These molecules cannot absorb or emit that long wave infrared radiation, that transparent for that. But those molecules which have three or more atoms, most of this, those molecules are absorbing that radiation quite a lot. These, these molecules are causing greenhouse effect. So we speak about greenhouse gases. If we would 
look at the Earth from the opposite direction, you would, uh, it, the Earth would seem to be cold because most of the radiation coming to the space comes not from the surface, which is warm, but from very cold air uh, layers, eight kilometers above the, above the surface, which are very cold indeed, and from the outer space, the Earth would seem as having some minus 18 degrees Celsius. In, but at the bottom, below that atmospheric crater, because of greenhouse gases, it has some 15 degrees above zero. So, uh, greenhouse gases affect not long wave radiation. The complicated picture, which is not yet translated into Czech Alpha version, when there are well, leaflets, notes around the Czech ones, uh, you can find it. I would, it's written in Czech. <laughs> I should read it in English. Uh, I will give a good link for an English version of this scheme. It's a very complicated scheme, but we are interested in those three uh, fluxes of radiation. These two arrows symbolize solar radiation absorbed by Earth's surface. The amount of radiation radiated from the surface upwards under the sky is three times larger than the absorbed solar radiation. How is that possible? How can the surface emit thrice the amount of energy as it absorbs from the sun? Well, the reason is that this radiation, again, long wave infrared radiation emitted by the air itself, is quite strong. It's twice stronger. There is twice more that radiation, or that radiation than that of that of absorbed solar ones. So these fluxes, well, the, the huge one, the smaller one, and the even smaller one, the, these were in balance 200 years ago. Now they are not in balance anymore. The amount of this radiation has has risen because of stronger greenhouse effect, and it will it rises even further. So. How strong is the downward radiation from the atmosphere? How strong is the greenhouse effect? One third of a kilowatt per square meter is the amount of radiation coming from the, from the air downwards. Solar radiation absorbed by Earth's surface is twice lower. So this greenhouse effect is a huge one. Greenhouse effect is twice stronger than absorbed sunshine. And we have changed this effect a bit by 1%, which seems to be a very small change, but actually it is a huge change. The pace of warming, which are we observing now, is probably stronger, quicker than any time in geology history of the Earth. Maybe at the Earth of Permian, well, when the Permian epoch changed to Triassic, Epoch, maybe the warming was uh, well of similar magnitude, similar uh, similar tempo, but probably it was slower than now. But in spite of that, maybe slower tempo, the pace of uh, you know, extinction of species was extremely high, and the amount of extinctions was extremely high. Well, it took a longer time, of course, but we are ch uh, we are witnessing a change which is more big, maybe quicker lasts not so long at the moment, but it will have very similar consequences like that lead extinction at the end of the Permian. Well, I have uh, uh, some texts on global warming, its impacts, its mitigation, mostly in Czech, but some in English. There is a small textbook in English as well, uh, yeah, speaking about it. You will, you, you, you have that, uh, well, you will have that link in your learning materials. But we have limit, we will limit ourselves to the health effects of climate change, which are many and very serious, not to the physics uh, so much and, and, and other impacts. Well, the main health impact of climate change is drought. Drought affects even our country. In Czechia, well, the profits of people working in agriculture in southern Moravia are diminishing because of drought. We had, it was traditionally southern Moravia, the region south of from Brno was very rich, with very high production from Blanderča, from, from agriculture. Nowadays, the uh, the well, tons per hectare are larger on the uh, in the mountainous, mountainous region, uh, the hilly region between Czechia and between Bohemia and Moravia, which was traditionally quite poor, but it has some water even in our epoch. 
whereas in Saudi Arabia there is a lack of water and the world people working in that, that uh, activities are affected, so they are very unhappy because of it. Well, even some population is affected by having no water in their wells, uh, by being forced to take water from some cisterns which are transported by the municipality uh, to their streets and so on. It existed in 2015, it will exist in other summers in the future as well, but it is a well, small discomfort. The real problem comes uh, into well, existence in those regions which were always rather dry, but they were uh, well productive, they were maybe uh, and there were three well, well, they had some crops three times a year, maybe, well, vegetables, fruits, and everything. For example, there was a region called Fertile Crescent. It went from Israel, Lebanon, through Syria to Iraq. It was a cradle of our European, Mediterranean and European well, Neolithic culture, Neolithic agricultural production. So it was a place where the oldest towns were created <coughs> uh, because of stable climate which enabled well evolution of every culture, evolution of trade and so on. And they, the, these regions were rather dry. But well it was a stable climate lasting ten thousand years. Now it changes already. And there are there are situations when there is not enough water in those regions <coughs> and well lack of water, a, a terrible drought uh, may disrupt all regions. So, Arab Spring started with with uh, with the price of uh, crops getting higher because of drought and, and heat waves in Russia and in Texas. So the prices went up. Some people were not able to pay for for their bread for their meals. Uh, well, they were well, they killed themselves. They, uh, you know, they were uprising. They were unrest in whole of Arab world, almost all Arab world, with the exception of Syria. Everybody says oh, Syria is a rich country, it has, it has, uh, well, it has uh, oil, uh, it has, uh, well, it has strong police, educated people, of course, and so on. And they, well, the Tal population was very educated, and so on. So, nobody, well, but in Syria there will be no problem. Unfortunately, uh, however, uh, not many people paid attention to what is happening there. There were four dry winters. There were a series of dry winters without no, with no precipitation in inland Syria and in Iraq. Such a situation did not happen the millennium before. It was a completely new situation which has led to the total disruption of agriculture in, in Syria. So two million people moved from from countryside to the outskirts of towns because they lost all their crops, they have to, had to kill all their animals because they have no, nothing to feed them, uh, they had no more income because they had nothing to sell, so they, uh, well, they created a new very poor population in, in cities, uh, which was uneducated, were strong people, uh, which were used to carry about themselves, they were able to do everything themselves, they of course weapons, uh, um, traditionally. But the, uh, the regime uh, well, could not somehow handle those people. They, some politicians in Syria were aware of that, and American embassy sent some Depeche to, to the, uh, the, the state, uh, to the state, to the minister, uh, to, the, to the administration in the United States, but somehow it did not well come together. There, there was no real attempt to try to help Syria to overcome that, that uh, well, catastrophe actually, um, the, the climatic catastrophe. And so there were some unrest, they were well, 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 suppressed with the bloodshed, and a civil war uh, started, and it has, there is no prospect that it will end in the near future. And if it would end, we are absolutely sure that it is not possible to restore agriculture in fertile crests, and so the people have to live elsewhere. There is no sense in, re in restoring the cities there, the, the towns in those arid regions, because there will be no agricultural production around them. So, it's, well, it's not nonsense to live there. Those people have to live elsewhere. But where? Well, in other countries are affected by drought. Somalia was disrupted by drought decades ago, or Gergi. Sudan, southern Sudan, Darfur, the, the war in Darfur was 
to population against themselves. There was not enough water for everybody. So, well, the uh, people with herds and with horses, well, traveled through the country and they burned out the villages, they killed everybody they could kill, of, of settled people, of, of agricultural people. Yeah? So, well, there was not enough water for everybody. And it proceeds, of course, it goes on. Afghanistan has less water in those many valleys in mountains who are traditionally inhibited. So those valleys cannot feed so many people as before. The, the people have to move elsewhere, and they are doing that. Mexican people uh, from countryside have not enough water, so again, there is too many people, the production is not so high anymore, they have to move elsewhere. And are doing that. Uh, so, no wonder. Well, loss of livelihood leads to conflicts, to genocide eventually, to civil wars, to, to disruption of state structures, to migration inside those regions. So the people are usually not moving very far. They are moving when they can walk. Uh, they are surviving in some camps. Well, there are three million people from Syria living in Turkey in some, some <coughs> camps. Uh, with, without any school education and so on. Uh, so this is a very poor way of living, very, very unhappy way of living, but many people are affected like that. Some people are so brave, so strong, so healthy, that they risk a long travel from Afghanistan, for example, to Europe. Or in other people, uh, well, the families collect all money they can, can, can lend and, and put together to send somebody to Europe. If I succeed in that, and be, if those people get to Europe, actually, well, then it is a well fortune for the family because those people who work in Europe with very bad pay, payments, very bad salaries, so sell, selling some something on, on fair trades and so on, well, they are people with very low own consumption, so they don't drink a lot of alcohol, they don't travel far enough uh, away. Well, they spend maybe half of their very poor, very small income and half of their income is sent back to their families. And, for example, Senegal is one of the richest countries in uh, Africa, but still more than 10% of their of the production, GDP, uh, domestic production, is uh, gross GDP, uh, gross domestic production. More than 10% comes from money sent to the families, direct to the families by their members living in Europe. So it is a process which keeps many states still existing and living and functioning a bit without influx of that direct money from people who succeeded to work in Europe to their home countries like Afghanistan, Nigeria and so on and so on is the only way how to keep the, these countries existing and working somehow, not very well, but people can live there somehow, thanks to that money. Uh, road is the worst, uh, worst uh, uh, symptom of uh, worst, the consequence of global warming, but in other regions are affected by floods. For example, there were uh, three hurricanes in, in Karibik last autumn, and because of these three hurricanes, we did not hear so much about the catastrophe which proceeded more slowly in Nepal, India, Bangladesh, when tens of tens, million, tens of millions of people were affected by floods, by monsoon rains, which were which were stronger than usually, which were so strong as never before. So huge areas were flooded, uh, and some people lost their livelihoods forever. Some were, were affected somehow. It is a very bad situation, very grave situation. In other cases, uh, strong, small, well, long, several hours lasting uh, 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 precipitation from typhoon, cyclones, um, is very problematic, or uh, the sea comes, uh, the, the sea surge, uh, 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 storm surge comes from the, from the ocean and, and floods, the, floods the region. Uh, these are problems which are short-lasting, but maybe very, very, very disastrous. Devastation by extreme wind. It happens in Caribbean this autumn. It was a, well, they have very good forecasts, they have some shelters, so not many people were killed by the wind. But unfortunately, up to now, for example, Puerto Rico, uh, there is no electricity in many cases, there is no potable water, uh, well, so people are dying because of infections and so on. 
just now, not during the hurricane, but now. This is the article about that. Read that, please. Yeah. So, even such a region which is under U.S. Uh, administration is not able to cure itself in time so that while well, the population is dying, many people have to move elsewhere. They have the right to go to the United States. Very probably the next election on Florida will be affected not just by Cuban immigrants, but also by people from Puerto Rico. And they won't vote for Republicans, for sure, yeah. because that Republican administration is not caring for them at all. <coughs> yeah. So, in other regions are affected by weather patterns which are unusual, <laughs> but very unusual before. So, it is out of the previous limits. So, all our systems are adapted, are tuned to the well, limits of weather, which was usually the last hundred years. But it is where we have different states of weather, different different weather patterns now, which are not which are which we are not adapted to. And this also leads to in some countries which are not so strong, which have not so well not everybody is insured, the the government is not caring for the peasants and so on. So in such countries people lose their livelihoods, become well they have to sell everything, they have to work as a well procreate uh, and or to move elsewhere. So it is well this is a process which which proceeds and will be the problem in the future. Less of foodstuffs from sea is another problem. Over one billion people, so a milliard, we say in terms of that. So, well, more than one billion people uh, gets its protein, uh, their protein from sea. And this is okay, okay, uh, this also a problem already because warming sea acidification and anoxia, less, well, less, less, uh, you know, loss, loss of oxygen, not enough oxygen in the sea, um, leads to lower yields from, from hunting in the sea. And many people are affected already. And sea level rise is something which uh, which uh, started already, and it will be quicker and quicker in the future. And will proceed many centuries in the future. I will put a hyperlink on them today uh, to that to that problem. So it will proceed because of the ocean is too warm at a depth of 300 to 500 meters already, and it melts ice at the at the outskirts of Antarctica and of Greenland from from below, and when that, those ice shells are melted, then more ice comes from the continent to the sea and it's rising the sea level. It will proceed next uh, many centuries in the future, even if we stop warming, so the ocean is too hot already, and it will be warming itself even if we stop warming on the surface. So there will still be circles of heat going into the depths of the ocean. So this is something which will affect uh, the future world profoundly. Within 300 years, it is quite probable that Rotterdam will not exist anymore. So it existed 300 years before Erasmus was working there, but 300 years in the future, it probably won't exist. It will be under the sea level already. This is a well, acute problem, actually, even in our country, uh, uh, becoming more and more, more usual. So. 2015, the summer was extremely hot, uh, and it was a problem already. This is a new article, rather new article, about the morbidity uh, and mortality in, in Arizona because of uh, too hot weather. But Arizona is a happy country because it is not too wet. It is hot, people are dying because of too high temperatures, but still it is something which can be somehow handled if people behave properly for that. But there are other regions uh, in the world which are affected, where the problem is much more serious. It concerns those places when the air is not just hot, but also very moist, like by the Red Sea, by the Persian Gulf, in Pakistan, in India. There are regions where people die, well, many thousands die per, uh, in summer because the weather is so hot and so moist that they cannot cool themselves down by sweating. So, we have always some basal metabolism. This is a number to remember. 100 watts, this is something, 100 watts is an average, uh, average amount of, of energy which is, uh, flows through us, through us by well, taking foodstuffs and producing heat. Yeah? If we sleep, it's 80 watts. If we 
Southern people with lower basal metabolism can have one output of 70 watt, but it, that, those 70 watt of heat has to be transferred away. But if the temperature is so hot and the weather is so moist that we have two thermometers here, one of them has, has, has a well, bulb which is dry and the other has a small wetted uh, piece of handkerchief around it. And there's a difference in the temperature. The one shows 23, 24 uh, degrees Celsius, and the other one is 14. So there is almost 10 Kelvins difference between those two thermometers because of very dry air here in this room. However, if that wet bulb temperature would be 35 degrees Celsius, then the, uh, the ability to, to cool themselves, ourselves down by sweating would be very limited. If it would be 20, uh, 30, 37 or 38, so, and it would last 10 hours. In that case, people die because of overheating. There is no possibility for themselves to, to cool them down. So, 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 this is the problem. What about temperature? When it is close to the body temperature, then, well, the situation is really bad. There is a region in Eritrea by Red Sea, which is not inhabited since some 100 years already, because it used to be so hot and wet even in the past. So, the agriculture would be possible there. But there are periods in summer, well, each five, ten years, which cannot be survived. There is a region like it, and those regions will expand vastly within 50 years. Well, several hundred million people at least will be affected so much that they would have to display. They, they, will, have, they, will, they, they would have to move elsewhere because there will be summers which cannot be survived. Oh, well, this is a very detailed article uh, speaking about uh, health effects of climate change, about most of many of them, a very thorough one, and please register to Lancet. This is free of charge, it's easy, I've done it, so I, I have this article, uh, but I won't put it uh, into your learning materials because it will be probably illegal. You have to register. And then you log in and it's easy. Uh, the Lancet is maybe with the best uh, medical uh, the journal at all, or one of the several best medical, British medical journals as well, very good, and so on. So please read Lancet and this article especially about, about climate change and, and health. Okay, this is one very broad topic. Uh, and the other one uh, is CO2 in the interior. It's a trifle actually, but we should be aware of that. So. CO2 uh, is primary indicator of if the air in, 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 in the building, in interiors, in, in well, waiting rooms, in classrooms, at home, is smelling or not, if it is pleasant or well, ugly. Uh, what is the reason? Uh, because of our metabolism, we are producing CO2, uh, carbon dioxide and water vapor. Uh, we breathe it out. Uh, well, the amount of uh, water which we breathe out is one liter per day, approximately, if you count it, uh, so, and, and all the CO2 is similarly. Uh, so, together with vapor vapor and CO2, uh, all the odors come out from our lungs, from or from skin when we sweat and so on. Uh, so, uh, well, when we stay interior, we diminish the quality of interior air. Uh, this is a, a graph showing the amount of CO2 of carbon dioxide in the outer air, in the exterior air, it is rising. This is the, well, the burning of fossil fuels rising. That uh, curve is called Keeling curve because of Charles David Keeling who started to measure it in the 50s already. And we know that, well, the concentration in the, before the industrial revolution was approximately one quarter of a per mile, so 280 per million. Now it is well, uh, over 400 per million. It was never over 300 per million in the quaternary period. So it was between 200 300 approximately. Now we are here and we move. We are moving upwards. So such an atmosphere with this composition was not existing, uh, well, the last 10 million years already. So we have a completely different atmosphere and if it will last for centuries. The world will change its vegetation systems and, and so on completely, and very probably most of the species will disappear. Species. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a, a very nice animation. Please uh, well, run it. Uh, we have no time for that here. 
<coughs> so, in the indoor air, the concentration of CO2 is always higher than outside. Not so much in this room, it's because we, has a, we have an extremely strong ventilation here, which has some unpleasant consequences as well. We will speak about it um, soon. So, well, I will, I've been always saying that the CO2 in the interior is such a, just a proxy for the odors, for the unpleasant stuff, including maybe some toxins or pathogens if there is a flu epidemic. So uh, it is better to have a lower concentration of CO2 because then we know for sure that we have well, a lot of fresh air indoors, which is nice, mostly. Uh, when the weather is pleasant, it's not so not very dry, so it's, ple it's nice to have plenty of outdoor air. Relative humidity is also a possibility how to how to know about the amount of fresh air, but it is buffered by the walls and by the furniture, by wood and so on. So CO2 is an ideal gas for for having uh, a knowledge about uh, how how uh, pleasant is the air inside indoors, but. Actually, it, uh, uh, it was uh, discovered, well, six years ago, seven years ago. I have the links in the chat presentation. I will put the links here as well uh, tonight. Yeah, okay, so we know now that even CO2 itself is a problem. If it is over one per mile or over two per mile, the cognitive functions uh, are worse. In, 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 well, between students and so on. So it is a new knowledge, we don't understand it at all, because why one per mile of CO2 plays any role? How much CO2 we breathe out when we breath? How much CO2 goes away from our from lungs? What is the concentration of CO2, of carbon dioxide, in our breath? What do you think? <coughs> I, I will write into the presentation. <laughs> I, 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 well, <coughs> supplemented the Czech one in the, at night, but I, I, well, I was not able to do this with English. It will be supplemented this uh, this evening, so we will have all the answers there. So, well, the uh, 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 well, the air which we breathe out is, has five percent of CO two, quite a high concentration. There is still plenty of oxygen in the air we breathe out. Well, it's still sixty percent. It's plenty of oxygen. It's the partial pressure of oxygen in the uh, outlet air is that large, like in well, in Alps or in Tatras. Uh, it is lower than by the sea level, but it's plenty of oxygen still. But the CO2 is 5%. It's quite a lot. If we would stay in an environment when the concentration of CO2 would be 7%, we would, we would die. But what about one per mile? One tenth of a percent? How it can make a difference? We don't know at all. It's incredible, but it was discovered that it is so, we don't understand it, and we, well, the uh, recommendation is keep the concentrations below one per mile. We have very low concentration here because we have a large lecture room, and, uh, and uh, uh, well, not so many people, and the ventilation is very strong in it. So we have 25 degrees Celsius temperature, it is a bit hotter. 8% relative humidity is extremely low, probably it is not so low actually, because the Instrument is heated by measurement of CO2. So, but the concentration is 600 ppm. It's a very low concentration. It's fine, but uh, unfortunately, now in winter time when the air is very dry, uh, such a very strong ventilation causes very low relative humidity, which is bad for our health. We will speak about it soon. Well, uh, what to do? How to behave during heat waves? Well, in our country, people like to go outside in the afternoon every day in summer. It was okay 20 years ago. It is not so okay some summers in these uh, last 10 years. So, in southern countries, people are adapted or have, they know how to behave in, during heat waves. So, uh, they are, well, they go at home at 12 o'clock. They stay at home till 5 o'clock in the evening or 6 o'clock in the evening. They sleep, they are have closed, they are closed windows and then sun shades and so on. And then in the evening when the air is more pleasant, they go outside, they, they go to restaurants, they buy for everything, uh, and early morning. So this is something which are, which is not the custom here, but it should uh, be, well, we should live like that as well in, in 
in Bavaria, in Germany, in Czechia, in Austria, uh, in, in, well, in Arad as well. This is something novel for us. What is this possible? The southern people know how to live in during heat waves. Uh, this is something also, well, simple, simple uh, knowledge. If we have a, a dry air enough, so we can cool ourselves very well by ventilation, uh, that, uh, by, by, by sweating. Uh, but we have to drink a lot. How to uh, persuade, how to move old people so that they would drink enough uh, water so that they would not have thick blood and, and, and problems with pumping it through the, with the heart, through the organism. So, how to move them to drink much more than during cold times? What is the way for that? Okay, put something sweet in the water. Like, uh, well, maybe, but, well, actually, sweet tastes in water are not, uh, not, not contributing to the, uh, to the last for drink more. Well, uh, Something sour is better. So, well, I recommend no sweets. I recommend, well, the, in the agriculture, in all times, in Czechia or in, in Norway, in Norway, I've, I've had it amusing that they put a bit of sour milk in the water or a bit of acid or acid, well, no, no, well, so vinegar, vinegar. And uh, uh, my recommendation, which is very easy to do, but put there something which most people drink a bit, put a drop of wine. So one tenth of wine in water means one percent of alcohol. You can drink a lot of it without any problems. So this is the way how to make the water uh, tasty. Yeah? And for children, it can be, well, five percent of wine in the water. So then you have half a percent alcohol. It's Even for children, it's okay when it is very well diluted. Yeah? And, and very young children and very old people have problems to drink enough. Well, people in our age, most or many of us drink a lot of like, like beer, so if you drink a lot of 10 degrees beer in summer or 8 degrees beer, that's okay, okay, also. So, even for old people, please bring them beer if they like it, faint beer or not so strong, or water with some something sweet. The sweet um, you know, tastes are not so so Sugar is not so good as, 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 as it's, as it's uh, so. Uh, a bit of wine as well, this is easy way, mostly. You know, don't let heat come, uh, come into the interior, so block the, block the sunshine, uh, block the, uh, uh, don't ventilate during the afternoon, do ventilate during night, so 10 o'clock in the evening, during heat waves, open the windows and turn, close them at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, what is the reason why people don't, uh, uh, don't uh, ventilate all the night? Uh, there are some, uh, well, they put some bit more tight, we, we had kind of one. Uh, uh, yeah, well, this is, don't let so much sun in the inside, so we have no direct sun, that's okay, but if you direct sun, it should be blocked, so that the, the interior would not, be, would not be overheated. If you want to ventilate, you need not, don't need ventilate any rooms which are not inhabited. You know? we, we, if we are not at home, there is no need for ventilation. But in classrooms, in waiting rooms by, by, by medicians and so on. When there are many people in small space, it's necessary to ventilate it, or well, necessary, it's comfortable to ventilate it. It can be ventilated in such a way that they, they do, you don't let heat inside uh, during the ventilation. Comfort Liftung is the German term for that. We have no English or Czech term for it. It's a system when the fresh air goes inside, and, uh, and meets the outlet air, not directly, but, but through system of membranes. So it goes inside, the warm air, and the cold air from interior go to, goes away. There's a membrane between those two, two, two uh, fluxes of air, and uh, the heat is transferred passively through these membranes. So on the membrane there is a temperature difference of some 2-3 Kelvins, and most of the heat is, stays away, is carried away against by the outlet air. So this is the way how to ventilate as you want, but not let heat inside in summer and not let cold inside in winter. So it's a, it's a heat recovery system. It is a very standard uh, technology in all passive houses. And it, it is the only technology how you can have a comfortable interior in uh, summer heat waves. Uh, in summer heat waves, people like that uh, if the air is moving a bit. Yeah, that's fine. But how to do that? Many people open the windows, but if you open the window and windows and there is 35 degrees Celsius warm air, which is not so pleasant, 
Ceiling fans are very good for that, or such fans. I have a fan like this. It's a from old computer. It's, it was a form shot. It was a, it's a base. Actually, I adapted it uh, for my uh, grandson uh, uh, for well, his plays. It, when he played it when he was three years old already, or two and a half years old, easily. It's safe. And it well, produces a nice flux of air into our home. You can put it by the computer, something like that. It's, it's not loud. And uh, we will shall see later how the temperature of the wet bulb will change. Now it is 13 Celsius, uh, it's 23, so the difference is uh, 10 Kelvins. And it will be probably a bit higher with ventilation. So ventilation, moving the air inside the room helps a lot. So it can be a ventilator like that one. Wood handlers, proper nighttime ventilation at night. Yeah. Actually, it's it's the truth. Uh, it's forbidden to leave the windows open during the night, the doors open, and so on. But it's a nonsense. We have a very good forecast. We are absolutely sure in many nights during summer there will be no storm during the during the night. So it's it would be very reasonable to open the window a bit yeah, like that and let it whole night through to open the. Well, this way, yeah? and the doors, and so, and to cool down the whole concrete building very, very comfortably, easily, cheaply, and have a very nice indoor environment during the day. But it is not the well, it is not the custom here. It is not, not done usually. In family houses, easy to to make it like that. In some cases, you need some some gitters or what's fat, no fancy, so some 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 well, some some structure, metal structure to to hinder entrance of people or, or cats and mouse and so on. But we are we are not doing that because it was not a tradition to, to cool down the, the the buildings during summer uh, during night. It, well air condition is something which is used uh, applied regularly more and more for example in offices of the city. But w what is this? This is Air condition is no ventilation like comfort lifter with fresh air. It is a system of circulating the air inside some apparatus. And actually the air is, uh, the quality of the air is diminished this way. Usually there is some, there can be some, well, in summer it is dehumidified this way. Uh, there are some wet, wet surfaces when there was well, the bacteria grow there. There was even, there were even, uh, there was even an accident or you know, a problem, an epidemic or when some uh, old soldiers assembled in a hotel in the uh, United States of Canada, I'm sure, in, in America, and uh, the indoor hair has too much legionella inside it, because, which gr has grown in the, the air conditioning system, and they were, well, they were ill then. Some, many of them died, actually. So there was, uh, the name legionella was, it was made because of legionnaires, actually, it was named afterwards, afterwards because of it. So such a system of Electric cooling by circulation is not a comfortable system and should be avoided whenever possible. No. Room temperature is something which is uh, which is, should be spoken about. Uh, we, uh, in many cases, the modern systems start, try to maintain the same temperatures day and night, winter and summer, but this is nothing comfortable. Uh, actually, if we are dressed very lightly in summer heat waves, we don't want to have very low temperatures indoors because it will be too cold for us in that situation. And what if I say the winter, which when we are dressed well, plentifully, it is not comfortable to have high temperatures inside because we are dressed too much. We need low temperatures in winter and in summer, which is the matter, of course. But it is not uh, actually, uh, well, the, the building industry and so on is not. Uh, uh, thinking about it so much. In the old times, the temperatures were changing day and night and, uh, and well, during the seasons, and it was actually very healthy. Uh, you know, I will close it because I have such a t shirt. Uh, yeah, so, but it, it is not moving anymore, probably. It, the, the battery is kaput. But what is the temperature? Yeah, it's 11 degrees and 20. Oh, well, the, the window was open out, so it's. It was affected, the experiment was affected by that. Yeah. But, well, actually, the, the temperature difference between those two, two temperatures would be some 11 degrees or 12 degrees with the ventilation. Uh, okay. Passive standard is a standard which avoids uh, cold surfaces. 
uh, like uh, well, window frames and so on. Uh, these windows are not the worst one in the world, but they are still not very good ones. So, passive houses have frightful glazings, much better frames, they have no cold surfaces, and in any case, you don't need so warm air uh, because there is no, nothing cold inside those houses. I have a, uh, well, from a camera, you can observe the frames which are much colder than the, than the glazings. Well, the interior wall is, of course, warmer than the exterior wall. Uh, so you can observe it yourselves. Yeah. Uh, to, uh, okay. yeah. Well, it will start shortly. So you can observe different directions, have different temperatures. In passive standard, the temperatures are S. As well, it, it's almost the same temperatures, no, no gradients, it's a very comfortable um, yeah, environment to live. Any old building can be adapted almost up to the passive standard. In the old times, people, as well as animals, were adapting from summer to winter, uh, increasing their basal metabolism. Uh, it was comfortable, and it was observed in Japan in the 70s, it existed, people had higher metabolism in winter than in summer. It was comfortable. But now we are living in an environment which is not changing. We are living in warm environments all the time, and this season adaptation doesn't exist. That's a pity, because it's very, very reasonable to have that adaptation. In the United Kingdom, the medical recommendation for, uh, for uh, indoor temperature is this one. Uh, well, I'm not sure if you have, or for what, which countries do you come, uh, I have a small leaflet, and please write down what temperatures, if you don't it, do you have in your environment, in your well, rooms when you live, in your offices and so on, uh, by your grandfather, well, anywhere. So you can write several temperatures, well, this is my temperature, our parents' temperature, this is my, uh, well, grandpa uh, temperature at home in winter. This is the recommendation from British medicians. Well, 18 degrees Celsius, always enough. Very old people, not moving at all, not eating so much, may have a bit higher temperature or a bit more clothing. And young people have, can have a bit low temperatures or a bit more clothing, depending on their movement and so on. So this is enough. In our country, the indoor temperatures are much higher indeed. So, well, I've closed the window, so it has risen already. Uh, 22, it will 22, uh, 24 very high temperature compared to that standard. Why it is not so reasonable? Well, I have just text text about it, which is, which is based on English sources, so I will, I will make an English version of the text, which is targeted for Central Europe, for communist prime, uh, for former communist countries. Actually, in Russia, they have even higher temperatures in winter, quite usually, uh, than we have in Czechia. But in Britain, or in England especially, the temperatures in the 70s were around 13 degrees Celsius. Some people have 11, some, some maybe 15. Now the average indoor temperature in winter in Britain is 18 degrees indeed. Some people have 20, some people like Prince Charles have 16 at home. 16 is enough, you know. I have 16 at home or 15. Um, when I'm sitting by the computer, I'm clothed very, very thickly. When I'm going outside, I, I take less clothes than inside because I'm moving outside. When I'm sitting by the computer, well, 15 or 16 is completely enough for me to ride without having cold hands. Uh, so, and this is, uh, well, quite new research uh, speaking about adaptation to cold temperatures. There is no help if you are using cold water uh, to try to adapt to winter. No, it does not help at all. But if you stay a couple hours a day in cold environment, like 16 degrees Celsius or 15 degrees Celsius, your metabolism is, uh, well, gets higher. You build that tissue in your body, brown adipose tissue. This is a, this is a kind of fat which is not white, but, but brown. And it has, can have quite strong heat production, uh, warming you. That's comfortable. The inner people have that tissue. And, in the same time, you you need more energy for that. So, well, actually, this article speaks about staying in cold temperatures in winter probably would be a way how to counter overweight and obesity, one of the ways to do that. So, this is an old uh, encyclopedia, which is not so bad, but it is old, really. So, well, there are captures about everything. There is a capture about heat and cold, but that 
research concerning brown adipose tissue is not contained there. But well, the basic old known facts like which temperatures are comfortable, which are high enough, and so on, this is written quite well in that encyclopedia. Uh, well, another problem is relative humidities. We have a very low humidity here, which is bad actually. Uh, why we have so low relative humidity? This is because the amount of water in the outdoor air, in today especially, is extremely low. In the morning when I came to the campus, I've noticed there is no frost, no white surf, no white frost on the cars. Normally, when it's a cold night, everything is white. No, there was nothing white, because the dew point was something like minus 15 degrees Celsius. This is an extremely dry air from Siberia. If you take that air, let it inside and heat it up to 23 degrees, it becomes extremely dry, 10%. This is completely unhealthy, unpleasant, but unfortunately this is the case with our very strong ventilation system, which is stupid. Well, we should not ventilate so much when the air is extremely uh, dry. Yeah. We can measure the relative humidity very reliably with a pair of thermometers. I will put a table um, of temperatures and temperature differences so that you can measure them yourselves very accurately. This is reliable. Such an instrument is very good, but it probably usually lasts some one, two, three years and then it measures rather badly the humidity. This is a reliable way with thermometers. Well, in some cases it's nice to have uh, less uh, moist air it is possible to dehumidify it in passive houses, some system of ventilation is that it takes some water, some water content is out of the fresh air and you can, if you have uh, relative humidity like that in summer, it's comfortable already. But usually in normal houses they are 80-90%, it's okay when the weather is not, not very hot, but in hot weather it's unpleasant. In very cold weather, old houses have a problem that they are cold surfaces, uh, so cold, on outer walls and windows and round windows, that some moisture is condensing there and there is some wall there eventually, so this is not pleasant. Uh, well, recommended, the usual recommended solution is ventilate more, but this is a symptomatic solution. The causal solution is to make the building much more airtight so that, uh, uh, well, that uh, uh, the humidity does not go so low in winter. The building should not ventilate when you are not inside. Should be ventilated just, just when you are when you are uh, uh, living there, being there. And this is a very new uh, popular article by some meteorologists about research in the United States what causes epidemics of flu, and it's definitely it is the uh, dry indoor air. So the incidence of flu uh, goes very up when the air is very dry outside and inside as well. So we should be, we should try to keep the air in, indoors uh, not so dry in winter. So the envelope should be tight enough. In passive houses there is some system of ventilation and if you use it, uh, they can, it can be, well, they, there are two ways how to, um, of heat recovery. One is pure heat recovery and the other is a system where the membranes are salty and even the humidity is recovered. So in winter you can ventilate plentifully to have the indoor air below one per mile of CO2, but to keep moisture inside. This should be used in winter. This exists, but should be used everywhere, especially to prevent flu in, well, in classrooms, for example. Uh, making a building tight enough is this easy task. I have a... Somewhere I had a... Oh, this one. So you can make all the windows and, and doors airtight using such a simple uh, piece of plastics. I've done it 20 years ago at home and now we have no dry air in winter anymore. Not very dry air in winter anymore because the building doesn't ventilate the more the larger the temperature difference. Now, well, uh, our team are of course pollutants, pollutants of physical nature. Uh, this book was the first one which put a lot of attention on the pollutants, especially on DDT. This was a book describing the outcome of too much DDT being accumulated in birds, so that the birds had no strong envelopes of their eggs, so they destroyed all their eggs sitting on them, and the populations, well, disappeared, so they 
they were situations that there were no birds singing in the spring in the United States in those times. That book had a, had a huge impact. DDT was forbidden in the United States and in Europe as well. And it was an example of chemical pollution. But radiation can be a pollution as well, like light at night or heat well, from thermal power plants. Uh, sometimes people say, is it a pollutant or not? If it is not natural, it's a pollutant. But actually, any stuff or, or physical fields or radiation which we add to the environment, and changing it, it is pollution. It is enough. So the natural state of the environment is the proper one. And it's nothing novel. Actually, all the old legends and myths about the world, or how the world was created and so, speak uh, about the original state of our Earth like the paradise, like the ideal one, uh, supplying us with everything we need. There are still some natural, uh, natural uh, nations which live in, well, the population as it is not so high, and they have enough foodstuffs from their surroundings uh, for a living within one or two hours per day. Oh, we don't need to devote them times, all the times uh, for getting food. No, well, one hour is enough, two hours is enough, and the rest is for fun. That's a nice way of doing And it was actually, this is possible with an environment which is not spoiled by, by us polluting it. Particle matter is the one very well known physical pollutant. The worst one is that of very small uh, sizes. So, si the size of what is less than 10 micrometers, less than 10, two and a half. This is regulated somehow in Europe and the United States. But these pollutants of very small sizes are much more problematic. Why? Uh, the large particles make respiratory problems, that's fine, that, that's true, but they are not getting inside our blood system, inside our cells. But those very small particles, uh, which are nanometer sizes, so less than one micrometer, then can get inside our cells. And if they're, well, they have very large outer surfaces, relative, and they absorb toxins like uh, benzoapyrene and, well, in other cancerogenic compounds which are produced by burning, by, well, not idle burning, uh, uh, from, from cars, for example, or from stoves and so on. And they are really, really cancerogenic. Diesel engines are producing those particles in some large amounts and, well, of stoves and so on. Diesel engines is something which should not exist inside cities when many people live. So, uh, some European towns try or they announce that they will forbid entrance of diesel vehicles, for example, in Paris or Stuttgart, uh, within well, some a decade, something like that, because it's very poisonous and we know that we should avoid that. We did not know that 20 years ago. Uh, no, in Czechia, well, the speciality is that particle thinkers that just don't work as well. They are actually, they are dismantled, they are, they are, they are, uh, they are damaged so that they don't filter at all. Uh, this is a situation special for Czechia. But what well, the problem exists in your group, of course, as well. And the last part of our radiation waves. Well, Light is a pollutant at night. Ionizing radiation is a problem, but actually it does not affect so a large part of European population. There are some regions, for example, between Bohemia and Moravia, when there is a lot of uranium in the in the uh, uh, in the well in the rocks. Uh, so ventilation is uh, enough to, to to have low concentration of radon at home. But not many houses are affected by it. Solar radiation is a problem actually, and it. Well, it damages slowly your retina, not very quickly, it is not a huge problem, but it exists. Uh, if you spend a lot of time outdoors, it's reasonable to, to protect your eyes with dark uh, goggles and, and, and a peak, uh, so that, well, solar radiation does not, well, uh, that this retina is not so worn out so quickly. So, macular degeneration is the name for that. Ultraviolet radiation from sun is also a problem. Uh, it will damages the skin, and it can lead to uh, to melanoms. Uh, and many many things people have. We need a lot of sun for D vitamin for D vitamin. Well, actually, not so much sun is needed for that. If you go in winter, what an hour, twenty minutes, uh, just your face and hands are enough to get enough uh, to get enough D vitamin. So it's enough. 
no whole body uh, insulation. This is for nothing. You do not need that. Uh, well, it should, it should be avoided as much as possible because otherwise the skin is getting much older than it should be uh, at, at that or that age. And light at night is the new problem. No, new. It is not a new problem. But we speak about it more and more. We know that light at night is a very, very large problem. Uh, one of the questions I would like to pose to you, do you have enough darkness for sleep? Right, yes or no? no? Enough darkness. And if you have not enough darkness, do you try to protect yourself from light at night to sleep well? Do you do, are you doing that or not? No, that's right, I, I, oh, I'm doing it that in a way. What are the ways to, to, um, to have enough darkness for sleep? What are the techniques for achieving that if you have some lamps before your windows? So, well, one of these is this one, so with the blinds. But if you have blinds, unfortunately you don't have enough light in the morning, so it's not so <laughs> comfortable to get out. Do you remember how you uh, wake up, uh, woke up in December or, or January? And what's the difference when half past six it's already too light and it's seven o'clock, it's, it's, well, it's plenty of, of daylight already. So it is a very large difference. Well, the change of day and night is very healthy, very good, and so, well, uh, the better way, actually, to protect yourselves from, uh, from, uh, several, okay, no, but, uh, something like this, but, uh, so, uh, this is okay for, uh, against light at night, it's more comfortable than the blinds on the windows, because you can put it away like that, and it's, well, it's comfortable. Many people are using it. I'm using uh, this this cap actually, uh, so that I put it like that. Uh, in winter, it's okay. It's not so hot. It's more well, thin. And in, when I'm traveling from Brno to Prague, for example, by train in the morning sometimes, I'm uh, in Brno. I'm I, I take a coupe, which is empty. I lay down uh, uh, on the seats, and I stay there very comfortably. I have also well earplugs in my ears uh, to be not disturbed by by well the Reproductors and so on. And sometimes it's happened that in Pardubice, which is midway between uh, Brno and Prague, or closer to Prague actually, um, the people are staying in the corridor and they don't disturb me when I'm laying so alone in the coupe. It's very, very comfortable, very, very useful. Uh, well, um, my arm could usually set for Colleen. I, I take a coffee then in the dining wagon. Uh, so, well, what? Using Protective measures is very reasonable, very comfortable. So, well, do that to protect your sleep. Uh, one of, uh, you know, uh, there is the last team, uh, yellow glasses. Uh, what could be the purpose of yellow glasses uh, to use them at night in the evening? Yes, because the blue light is that component of light which is affecting our metabolism at, at, at most. Yeah, so, this protects us from producing melatonin. Melatonin is produced at night, and the blue component is steering that. So, if you avoid blue component, if you take some yellow glasses, yellow goggles, if you are forced to work in the evening with a strong white light, it helps a lot. So, I'm using that, I'm doing that, but also I'm also do, uh, using another technology, this one. Uh, so, 12 volt uh, systems, uh, which are safe, anybody can work with it, it's even for children. And I'm using just, just yellow, faint yellow lights or lights, LED lights, which are not completely yellow, but I can put a yellow floor over them at night, in the evening. So I'm illuminating the ceiling or the working surface like that, uh, not, with a very, not, not very strong light, without the blue component, because it's comfortable. I'm doing it since, oh, 15 years. Uh, something like that already, uh, and if not uh, very low amounts of light at home, several looks of yellow light, this very probably not uh, not affecting the metabolism. People have used light since hundreds of thousands of years, but it was just flames, not very strong and yellow. So this is something we should use even in the future. Uh, uh, oh, I have a whole lecture about uh, light and and noise uh, for fifth grade. It will be, it will appear several times now in spring, so if you are interested in these things, I will speak much more, three learning hours about just light at night and, and sound. We have not, not much time, but ta much more time here now at the moment. But I will mention uh, two things regarding noise. So we, you have the, the links in the, well, 
Uh, uh, well, I, I, I think I've opened already that. Yeah, this one. Yeah. So uh, there is a very good site. Uh, uh, there, there are several links uh, regarding noise as a problem. And one of the problems with noise is that we have some very sensitive cells which are amplifying the sound signal by 50 decibels. It means uh, factor 100,000 to 1. So not 1 million times, but 100,000 times. Very sensitive system, fantastic system of amplification of, of, of sound. But if it is exposed to 100 decibels, 110 decibels, very quickly, within, well, within hours actually, uh, some hairs, which are very thin, there are several nanometers thick only, are already damaged and this system of amplifying the sound signal orders of many orders, five orders of magnitude, is uh, destroyed gradually. What is so important? Everybody who is getting old uh, loses its sensitivity to, to sound, but especially to very high frequencies. What is the problem? If you listen to human speech, there may be some basic frequencies, I'm speaking well, well, at low, well, low frequencies, but to understand what I'm saying, you have to distinguish S and Z and D and T and so on, and very high frequencies are needed for that. If, you, if your uh, ears are not sensitive to those very high frequencies, you don't understand human speech anymore, or very badly. So, if you want to understand your grand and grandchild grandchildren, which will be usual. So now people, you will probably live up to 100 years. So you will see two generations of well, grandchildren and grandchildren. It's really pleasant. But it's a one of, well, one of the happiest moments in Iraq if you have communicated with those very small children. And you will have time for that. But the necessity is you will understand them when you're speaking. They are speaking very high voices. So please protect your ears to be able to hear very high frequencies even when you will be old. And the other effect which I have to mention is, if you are communicating with patients, with old people, please be aware that they will hear you. They are not deaf. But if the environment is not completely silent, and if they are not seeing your mouth, they don't understand what you are saying. So if you want people, old people to understand you, you they have see your face, it helps them tremendously. If they don't see your mouth, quite probably they won't say you, I didn't understand, but they didn't understand. Very probably they didn't understand. Well, it's a very simple message, they know what you are, what you are speaking about, but if you want to say them something which they did not know before, it's very important that you speak slowly, in a low voice, and you, they see your mouth because they are hearing, but they are not understanding human speech because of those high frequencies not uh, being uh, amplified enough anymore. Well, and the last thing we should mention uh, concerning sound is, I will project the, uh, this is, well, something about the measurement of sound. There will be a question about it. Uh, in your in your world uh, later, so uh, ten decibels. This is ten times more. Everybody knows that. Twenty decibels is one hundred times more. Thirty decibels is one thousand times more. But about, what about five decibels? Five decibels is well, one is some ratio. If you we add another five decibels, it's ten decibels already. So it's ratio one to ten. But well, five decibels is multiplied by some number. And another multiplied by the same number makes 10 decibels. So, uh, 5 decibels is a square root from 10. So, it's a, this ratio, 3 to 1, this is 5, uh, five decibels. You know, 5 decibels means 3 times more, more, uh, more energy, more, more acoustic energy. 2 decibels, uh, no, well, 3 decibels is a ratio from 1 to 2. So, 2 decibels more, it's twice, 3 decibels more is twice more. Another 3 decibels, 4 times more. In other 3 decibels, 8 times more. So 9 decibels is very exactly 8 times more. And this is something we should be able to handle with. Why? Because in some cases, the, well, the business people say, oh, we will be a new airport. And the amount of the acoustic level will, be, uh, will rise just by 5 decibels. It's nothing. Well, 5 decibels is 3 times. It's not nothing. It's quite a lot. 3 decibels is 5 times. Whether it's a lot or not. 
if you get a beer, full beer, and you, well, well, three decibels is nothing. So three decibels less means half a beer. That's different. Well, so three decibels is not nothing. It's an important number in many cases. And in the European Union, hundreds of thousands of people are dying because of, uh, because of noise uh, per year. And, well, it's very important to reduce the uh, amount of uh, the, the, well, the sound levels, not to increase them by several decibels, but to reduce them three, five, ten decibels. Hypertension, cardiovascular problems, well, well stress and, um, uh, and, 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 well, angry people are a result of what, uh, what, what uh, well, the exposure to sound makes. And, of course, uh, sleep disturbances. Uh, sleep disturbances are very well the cause of obesity and diabetes. Not enough sleep, not enough long sleep uh, means you, you well, are more hungry in the morning, you have more lust to, to eat more, uh, so this is a problem. Tinnitus is one of the problems. If, and, you know, and, well, the last, you know, well, sleep well, it means uh, darkness and silence. And the last item, uh, you know, the two of them. Uh, my question, I, I forgot to mention it. Uh, Please write down. Did you? Did I put the double leaflets to you? No, I did. No, well, I did not. No. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. Well, I would. I'd like to, for you to write down. What time did you go to sleep uh, tonight or before today? So, well, it's an anonymous. I, I have large box where all the leaflets are put in. So, at what time went you to sleep last time? What is the average length of your sleep during the week when you are going to school? So, for example, there is some concert in the evening and some things, and there is a school in the morning. So quite probably you sleep a bit less, and write out the number, how many hours do you sleep? In that case. And the last question, how many hours do you sleep if we have no limits for that? So, during holidays, for example. So, when you get out in the morning, well, it's, it's nice, I'm so happy, it's morning again, uh, and well, I have no need to sleep anymore, so what is the ideal length of sleep for you when you have no limits, uh, no, no need to get up in the morning or to, to, well, not to get up early to bed in the evening and so on. So, several questions, like the, these are my questions. And the last item is, you know, do you use, please use protective measures against, against noise? Uh, any, in any case, when you are exposed to some noise and it's not pleasant for you, please take a piece of like something like that, with a heavy toilet paper, and put it in your ears uh, as a first, first as the hill so first, uh, first uh, help. Uh, the other way, please buy those air plugs here in the, the the machine, 20 crowns. It's very comfortable, very reasonable to use it whenever you want to sleep and there is a noisy environment or, or to work. And the last possibility is to wear something like that. When I spoke about this 10 years ago, well, it looked a bit crazy to wear something like that. Now it's quite normal. We are communicating or Skyping. Nobody is, well, curious about that. So please use that. It's very efficient. It costs something like 3 euro. <laughs> and it's very efficient. It diminishes the uh, sound level by some 30 decibels. Very comfortable. It is not good for sleep, maybe, if you are not, well, it's not sleeping in your, or, or, or your back only. Uh, but it's very efficient, and if you want to work in a loud environment, please use that. It's so easy and so comfortable. So this is the last recommendation from me. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry for well, speaking so long and so quickly. But, well, there were nine teams for two, two lectures, two, two hours, and it's too much. Uh, but everything will be written in, in the English well, version of that lecture uh, with hyperlinks and so on. So all the answers will be there to those many problems I've tried to speak about. So, thank you. Thank you.